Hello. Welcome to the Bank Street School for Children Health and Safety 2021-22 presentation. I'm Doug Connect, the Dean of Children's Programs and Head of School for the School for Children and uh, Family Center. I'll be walking you through our policies, what has uh, shifted this year, what is continuing, and what is new. All of these health and safety uh, policies are found in two places online. Um, one is the Bank Street College's health and safety plan, and that includes our policies for the entire college, all of the programming and staff. And um, uh, more directly of interest, perhaps, for families in the School for Children is the School for Children Family Handbook, which is available in Bank Street Central. And um, all of the policies that are relevant to the School for Children uh, that are in the Bank Street College Health and Safety Plan have been integrated into the School for Children Family Handbook. So that is the best place to go to first for questions around health and safety and other policies that we have in our school. I wanna um, offer a reminder that we have a health and safety town hall coming up next Wednesday, September 8th, 7 p.m. This is also a Reminder uh, for those who were here with us last year that we formed a health committee of expert uh, doctors uh, that include pediatrician Dr. Amy DeMadia of Westside Pediatrics, who's our, our core partner in the testing work. And uh, Amy has provided a lot of guidance day to day for our staff and our families um, through this pandemic. And Dr. Kowalski and Dr. Lim are part of the Mount Sinai Health System uh, focused on uh, epidemiology and emergency medicine uh, for children. So this is the core group of experts we've continued to meet with uh, since last year. And uh, Dr. Damadia will be joining us at the Health and Safety Town Hall next week. Here are the priorities for health and safety at Bank Street College and our school for children. It's very similar from the, the layers of um, health and safety that we talked about last year as we um, formulated our approach during the, during the start of the school year of the pandemic. Um, there's five key areas, the, um, some additional pieces that we are we're bringing to bear this year include um, the mandates around vaccination for all people who are eligible at this time. Um, and we're continuing with testing with slightly different ways, um, health screenings, and a number of other pieces, including the ventilation, air purification systems that we um, implemented last year to improve um, the flow, um, ongoing hygiene. Uh, we are continuing with masks and as much social distancing as we think is uh, possible from uh, moment to moment through the day and our hallways and stairwells and um, common areas. We continue to restrict group sizes, um, but the numbers are slightly larger this year and we're allowing a little bit more interaction between classes while we're also ensuring that we can do contact tracing. Um, we're gonna to continue to have the protocols in place around isolation um, and um, working closely with the Department of Health um, that um, our nursing team established last year. So I'm gonna review a number of these uh, pieces with you this evening and some I will touch on quickly. The air purification, um, work that we did last year is an example. So here's a, here's a slide and this information again is available in our health and safety plans, but this is the kind of work that we did to um, improve air quality uh, last year. And we're continuing with this. We have um, not only the HVAC system improvements, but also the, um, the HEPA filters that we've continued to put in on not only our classrooms, uh, but also our hallways um, and common areas. And we, we use the, um, the number of HEPA filters that are proportionate to this, this, the size of the space. Um, we're also working to keep windows open and frankly, just be outdoors again um, as much as possible. Um, we have CO2 monitors that give us a sense of the amount of uh, exhalation that's happening in each of the rooms as well. And our staff has become familiar with what to look for in terms of um, the use of those monitors. Mentioned masks a moment ago. We are continuing the expectation that everyone two years and older uh, must wear a face mask at all times. We have um, uh, 
expectations around the type of mask. We do not want one layer masks or um, cotton masks that um, do not have a, a, another layer of filter in them. So we're expecting adults um, to wear K95, uh, N95, KF94 options, uh, which the school and the college has on, on hand for people. Surgical masks uh, are also um, available for, for use and allowed. And that for children, I should clarify, we are allowing cloth masks of two or more layers. Um, and it, it is a good additional pro, uh, protection for everyone. If uh, wearing a cloth mask, it is cloth mask. It is one that you can include um, a filter in. So we have moments where children and, uh, and adults will be able to remove their mask. It's mostly around eating and snack and, and mask breaks uh, uh, in the day. But uh, mainly we're talking about outside of our premises uh, down um, perhaps down Riverside or parks, Big Rock. Uh, we expect people to continue to wear masks uh, on our play deck, on our roof, and uh, on 112th Street during arrival and dismissal. So as parents enter and children enter our street, we ask that you do your own mask check. And we will be gently reminding you if you need that kind of reminder. Vaccination. This is uh, one of the, um, the policies that we decided this summer to um, implement not only for adults, which is where, what we had um, uh, messaged last year uh, that all of our staff would be expected to be vaccinated um, or have an exemption in place. And I'm happy to say that across all our children's programs in the college, we do not have um, any staff who is unvaccinated working directly with children in classroom settings. Uh, we, we added to that policy as an expectation that students ages 12 and up, as um, it became clear that the, the Pfizer vaccine was going to be given full authorization, that we moved to announce that we we're expecting vaccination for all uh, students 12 and up. We have a, an expectation that, that um, all children will be uh, vaccinated at the beginning of the school within two weeks of the first day of school or within, um, as people, as children turn 12 this year, uh, within two weeks, they have their first dose of turning 12. Um, as vaccines are approved for younger children, uh, we're gonna continue to do what we have been doing, which is consulting um, not only our health expert team, but what we, um, what we have is a larger network of, of, of folks who are um, in the education policy and uh, public uh, health policy world. And we'll make a final determination on how we're going to approach um, uh, the mandate for, for children as they become eligible. We'll, of course, communicate that with you through the year. Um, right now, though, you should expect that we are planning to require vaccination, just as we do other vaccinations um, before the pandemic. Um, and then under New York City's key to New York City policy, um, we are a building. Uh, within the city that falls under their policy for proof of vaccination for all visitors. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the visitor policy later. Screening testing. Okay. So we are continuing to conduct testing. It will be once per week uh, this year for all people. That's both vaccinated and unvaccinated uh, adults and children. We're continuing with our partnership with Westside Pediatrics. I mentioned Dr. Damadia earlier. Um, they'll be our close partner uh, alongside with Parkway Clinical Laboratories or PCL. They're gonna provide the, the, um, the materials and um, administer the tests and get the results for us. And they've committed to getting those results within 24 hours. And they have held to that since we started working with them in June as a kind of a trial run. And then through the summer with our camps, Liberty Leads, and um, family center programming. There should be no costs uh, to any family members. So if this um, appears to be happening for you, we continue to ask you to reach out to testing at bankstreet.edu. Testing at bankstreet.edu is the email to reach out with questions around billing connected to testing. One other thing to note about our testing process this year is we are not going to have re-entry testing not in the beginning of the year. So as people um, come back and as students come back, 
we're just entering them into our testing program. We're not requiring a, a negative test to, to come back um, this fall. And we're gonna continue to have that same approach through uh, holidays and when there are breaks that happen as a result of um, the, our calendar. We are going to continue to use the dashboard uh, we created last year. Um, this was a, a, an idea that was provided to us by a number of parents and other community members uh, so that we could have um, as much clarity and transparency about what, what was happening in terms of the uh, transmission rate or the number of uh, the number of positives day to day or over a, a seven day positivity rate. And we could compare that to the larger cities data. Um, and so we have, uh, this is a, a snapshot from May. We don't have much data in uh, for this year. So this dashboard will be up and running within the next week or so and the data will start um, revealing more and more what our, what our current community's level of health around um, positivities for, for, for COVID is. And I wanna point out that below um, at the bottom of this dashboard, we have our own composite of our positivity rate so that pulls data from each zip code uh, proportionately in terms of the number of people who work in the building and children who attend the building and essentially weights those those zip code positivity rates in a way that brings to um, to light what the people coming into our building day in and day out um, have as a collective positivity rate and then we can see that that um, what that looks like in comparison to the cities and his you know when we started this last year it became evident that our community is coming from zip codes that have typically lower rates across the city. And so we would see a difference of maybe one or two percentage points. And through the summer, we actually saw kind of a, a, a difference of about half. Our, our rate was about half lower than the cities. But we'll see um, as we start the year what the dashboard offers us. OK, now if we think about when someone tests positive for COVID-19, what is our approach? A number of people. Um, we'll, we'll know from experience last year what this is, either as a person who had, unfortunately, someone test positive in, in their household or themselves or close contact and had to quarantine. So any individual who tests positive will need to isolate for 10 days. This is um, continuing policy um, and we'll be able to return to Main Street once after 72 hours of symptoms have resolved and they are fever free without using medicine. So those are our, those are our twin uh, this is what our nursing team asks. Um, symptoms resolved for 20 to 72 hours, and are you fever free without using Tylenol or any other? Um, we will continue to consider anyone within six feet of a person who tested positive for a cumulative time of 10 minutes over 24 hours. So that could be five minutes here, three minutes here, 10 minutes there um, as a close contact. Um, and uh, we will continue to have the same approach that we took, which is convening our, um, our essentially the core group of people in our college who conduct this kind of um, investigation around close contacts. We reach out to people, have conversations, we document this, we share it, and we make sure that we haven't missed anybody before then reporting um, to the Department of Health and communicating with everybody. So typically close contacts need to quarantine for 10 days. Um, that has been the policy. Um, and what has evolved in, the, in the, the last months is the use of testing to shorten quarantine, which I'm going to walk through in a, in a moment. Um, so there are some exceptions, but I do want to start from the perspective of if you are close contact, it is possible that you will need to quarantine for 10 days. Um, anyone who is fully vaccinated uh, or was diagnosed with COVID-19 within the last three months have an exception. We have one exception to the exception, which is um, if someone is in the same household, basically, who lives with someone who tested positive, even if they're fully vaccinated or had um, COVID-19 in the last three months, they also will need to quarantine for 10 days, no matter what. Um, so anyone who's fully vaccinated or diagnosed with, with the COVID last three months will have an exception to the close contacts rule and can keep coming to the building. Um, uh, dur during the quarantine period, except for those who have a household member who tested positive. And also the CDC um, shared a policy in June where they believe based on the data and the lack of transmission that they've seen across schools when um, children and adults are using masks and other 
safety measures that they recommend that um, children in an in indoor classroom setting with, with the masks on uh, through the day and uh, hygiene and adhering to other policies, high air filtration um, quality, that those children can come back as well through quarantine. Um, we are implementing something connected to this, though, that I will talk through momentarily called test to stay. So it's basically an increased testing for any of those close contacts through that quarantine period. Um, but before I touch on that, I just want to say that, um, you know, we are going to monitor this policy. This is a, a wonderful opportunity to reduce the impacts of quarantine and have children be in our school as much as possible this year. And um, as Dr. DiMattia mentioned to me the other day, this is also a policy that tests to stay that is being implemented really for the first time, um, you know, across the, across the city, across the country. Um, and so we all need to be careful and watch how this plays out. If there's any sense that there's been transmission or more than one case in a room, we will be erring on the side of caution and looking to quarantine the entire class. Um, so if there is a positive case, uh, the affected class will be tested every two to three days through PCL, so those are PCR tests, and should maintain quarantine requirements um, outside of schools for those 10 days. So we still want you to be careful outside of school if you are a close contact or your child is, um, and we'll be, it will be upping, we'll basically be dialing up the testing during those quarantine periods for those close contacts. That is the test to stay model. One other additional piece I want to um, add here is that for children who test positive this year, given the test to stay approach, where those who are exposed to a positive can come back under these conditions I've mentioned um, and continue to learn in, in school, there is the very um, high likelihood that it will be known which child is uh, has tested positive, um, and we are going to have to work to figure out how to make sure that that child stays connected um, to the classroom, assuming that they're asymptomatic and um, able to continue to, to engage and learn. Um, so we'll be sharing more about uh, that um, approach that we're going to be building, uh, both in terms of taking care of the, the child and the classroom together uh, in that circumstance, and our mental health team and uh, Dr. DiMatti have some uh, we'll have some ideas and, and things that we'll, we'll do that are building on our approach from last year. And we'll also uh, need to be um, communicating with you as teachers, think through that this, um, this difference this year, which you know, some of the cases may have actually played out that way last year, where there was an individual child who had to stay out due to quarantine um, and, and try to remain connected to the classroom at different age levels. Um, and those different age levels, of course, took different approaches um, based on technology and, and, and skill and um, self-regulation, all of that. So there'll be more to, more to come on those pieces, but I want to name that, that this, the implication of our policies this year will have this, this, um, this impact, and we will need to think about how to take care of those um, children and those families in particular that are being impacted by a positive test directly and um, how we come together as a community to support ourselves through those challenging moments. With regards to our attendance policy this year, we're keeping a number of pieces the same. So the top paragraph here you can see is essentially the same as last year. We have these two different groups of symptoms uh, below that I'm referring to. Uh, anyone exhibiting one or more of the symptoms under group one, so the um, serious, you know, um, kind of ob more obvious symptoms connected to COVID, um, including the, the loss of taste or smell and high, high fever. Um, so any one or more of those requires a PCR test that is negative and a resolution of symptoms to return. And also, as we had last year, any two or more of the symptoms in the group two set of symptoms will also require a negative PCR uh, uh, results and the resolution of symptoms. So that is essentially our policy from last year. We are adding another layer, and this is due to the um, recommendation of our health committee and what we've seen um, in the reporting and the research and what, what our, our um, doctor colleagues have experienced in their own settings, which is that um, the, breakthrough, the breakthrough infections of Delta 
and um, potential COVID um, cases in children can look initially like just one of these symptoms in group two. And so what we're gonna do this year is we're implementing uh, an expectation that if there's any one of these symptoms that's on, at its onset, this is not every day, but at its onset, um, that we require a negative result on a PCR, which would take 24 hours, or an antigen test, which would only take about 15 to 20 minutes in the morning. Um, so anyone who comes to Bank Street after receiving a negative antigen test, if they have one of the symptoms in group two, um, they can come, they'll get a clearance from our nursing team after that interaction, um, but they will also then be tested that day at, at school with a PCR so that we have confirmation of that negative within the next 24 hours. And I wanna spend just a moment on the, the antigen tests. So we have um, done some research and we're uh, purchasing for the college as a stock, the Binex now COVID-19 antigen tests. These are all available for purchase at uh, local pharmacies like Walgreens and CVS. Um, takes about 15 minutes uh, uh, after you do a self swab. And it's uh, you know about one inch or so and in, into the no each nostril and rotating five times. It's, it's not so different from what we do in our PCR testing at, at Bank Street. And um, when a person is symptomatic, antigen tests have a favorable um, accuracy rate. It is when a person is asymptomatic that um, antigen tests are, are less, um, we have less confidence in them. And given the speed of result, we are recommending and, uh, that people have these at, at hand, at, on hand in their, in their homes if there happens to be onset of congestion, for example, uh, with your child or as a staff member. And uh, to use these antigen tests uh, to get a negative result, we hope, and to share that through a picture or you know, some other way of confirming this with our nursing team before um, bringing your child to school or coming if you're a staff member. And so this means setting your, perhaps your morning routine uh, this year uh, back or up, I guess maybe earlier, about 15 to 20 minutes in case there is um, you know, a test that you need to run and you are trying to get your child to school on time and yourself to, um, any appointments or work. We will provide more detail um, in the coming days and we'll say that we have a limited stock at the, at the school and the college. Uh, so if people need to start the year uh, with one from us um, or times during the year perhaps need more, you can reach out to our nursing team and we will share what we have. In addition to that symptom screen, uh, each morning, we're asking you to fill out this questionnaire as we did last year. We're asking you to do this honestly. Um, this is part of our community agreement, and it is a core piece of our health and safety layers, this honest um, appraisal of what's going on for each person and each child, so that collectively we are taking care of each other. Uh, you'll receive a response after you complete the self-assessment. It may end up showing a yellow or a red. If that's the case, you will need to talk to one of our nursing team uh, before, the, before your child or you can come to school. We also have, instead of the kind of temperature um, tools that we used out on the street on the foreheads or arms of children and people, we have a thermal camera at the entrance of the, the lobby of our building. And it uh, indicates if there's anybody who has a temperature greater of 100 or more. Um, walking through. And so that is something that we instituted this summer during our programming with camps and, and uh, family center. And uh, we'll continue with that. Um, additional things to note about arrival so that you can start to get a feel if you were with us last year, how this will be slightly different. We do not have access to 112th Street to coordinate off this year. And to start the year, we are still in the process, at least in, it looks like in one portion of the front of the building, um, finalizing some construction that needed to be done on the facade of our building. And so there is a dumpster um, right in front of the eastern, eastern portion of our, our building and um, a little area that's cordoned off. And so it's going to be a little tight. And so the space is tighter. The windows of time to drop off children are a little tighter for most age groups. 
And we saw that we could do that after um, just a few weeks last year, but we didn't change the entire schedule. We did it for this year. Um, and I also want to note that we are, we are not going to have everyone lining up uh, in terms of children to be checked off by what we call the checker on the sidewalk. We are going to expect and we will be checking the data systems ourselves that parents and staff are completing the questionnaire and that people who are given a green are the ones who should be in our building. And so we will have reminders for, for those of you who may be forgetful at moments to fill out the survey. Those will be coming via text um, through the morning. And we will also have a check um, right at, right at um, um, arrival time of who is uh, cleared to come in. And we will be following people who have not filled out that survey. And we will continue to follow up with those folks if it becomes a pattern uh, or, or for some reason a concern. Okay, just a few more pieces of our puzzle that I'm gonna share this evening. Um, and I'll move through these a little more quickly. Um, just a reminder that our class sizes, while also um, still under kind of a constrained or smaller model, they're larger than last year. Uh, we've gone up to about 20 students. I mean, historically we've had classes that are below 20. So this can feel like a return to many people, but we have limited the size of the classrooms at 20. Um, so that does mean we've had, we have a few more sections in across the school than we would typically have had in the past. Um, we also have a strategic way of structuring interactions between classrooms last year. We, um, sorry, this year, last year, we constrained as much as possible, all of the pods in terms of interaction and had uh, very, very few moments. And they were potentially all outside where pods were even kind of near each other. Um, this year to make sure that we can have as rich programming as possible while also staying safe. We're, we're working for the premise that if we have a clear instructional or programmatic purpose um, for cross um, classroom interaction, um, activities during the day, um, you know, could be things like our um, affinity groups for children uh, or uh, some clubs and other activities. Um, we are going to um, be very thoughtful and careful so that we can do close uh, the, the contact tracing and keep a close eye on what's happening in those moments. Um, but we're not taking we're not taking big risks like um, bringing unvaccinated children together in an assembly um, or anything like that. We are also having some cross class interaction for after school or early morning care. Uh, they are resuming. We're having some more constraints than we have had in the past, but we do need in order to make it um, viable to staff. Um, to bring certain age groups uh, together. And um, there's more specificity about what those age group pairings um, look like in our health and safety plan and in the family handbook. I also wanna mention sports, uh, gotten some inquiries about sports. We are planning interscholastic play. So real game, real games and matches with other schools for our 12s, 13s and 13s, 14s. This is largely what the other schools are doing in our league that we play with. Uh, we've been in contact with them um, we're still working out all the particulars, but right now we are expecting that um, you know, only vaccinated children will be playing for other teams as well as our own. That's number one. That only coaches and children are, are present for these matches if they're indoors. So we're not having spectators come into our gym and we're not expecting to send our children into other gyms and buildings where there are spectators, um, even if they're all vaccinated. Um, and uh, masks are expected and um, to be worn even through the sports uh, activities. And then outside, we are working through what might be a little bit more of a, a leniency around spectators in terms of people being like perhaps, perhaps on a soccer field on the opposite side um, to spectate, to watch um, than the coaches and the kids who aren't you know, on the field. For 10s, 11s and 11s, 12s, so we've also had um, uh, sports in the past, we are going to be intramural. We're going to be doing intramural programming. So this is just within our own school. We're not we're not bringing uh, children into contact with children from other schools. Um, this also reminds me a bit of uh, constraints and and opportunities we're creating around music. Uh, we are into we're fully integrating the music um, pieces of the after school into our after school programming this year. Uh, we started that last year, and um, we are not going to have. Um, you know, uh, wind instruments or singing for unvaccinated children. And we're gonna be um, carefully starting the year thinking about how we 
potentially have those activities for vaccinated children. Um, so we're still working on that model right now. Um, we are reducing our, our restrictions around shared materials this year because of evidence of what we saw and I learned through the science of COVID that it's not being passed through the handling of materials. However, we're gonna to continue to um, clean and, and treat materials that we had in the past so that if there's hygienic use um, of those materials and also expect children to be washing their hands before, after, or perhaps even during the um, use of materials, depending on um, uh, what's happening. We are also allowing um, uh, and trying to make more clear this year that we, uh, we'll have uh, the opportunity for food to be brought in or shared um, from home or, or from stores. It would be nut free and we have to be aware of allergies in each classroom as always. Um, and this has to be approved, like planned and approved with the teacher. Um, ultimately, what you should know though is that there's no like buffet style of, of getting food for, for children. Everything that we um, allow children to have in classrooms, including from our own kitchen, will be divided up and shared from an adult to children um, in portions. So the children are not, you know, um, collectively um, pu putting their hands or, you know, or, or grabbing something together from one uh, bowl or, or something like that. Then um, I mentioned visitors much earlier uh, in this presentation. We are gonna allow a limited number of people to come in for specific reasons as we said, and as is the policy of the New York State, um, sorry, New York City, we need to see proof of vaccination. Um, we also want uh, people to complete the symptom screen, and they will, of course, have to follow our, our health and safety guidelines around use of masks, et cetera. Um, we may have uh, the ability for current parents and pers prospective parents to visit classrooms with children in them actively uh, working and enjoying each other's uh, company. But um, we, we would limit that. And right now we're thinking no more than five and it would certainly be a limit to the time that would be spent in the classroom. And there would be also limits to the, the spacing and um, what kind of activities those visitors could have. We um, are gonna be again, erring on the side of caution. We have not worked this out fully with um, each of the age group teachers and division heads. So this is a policy that has been evolving just the last few weeks and we're gonna be working on as we start the year. And then lastly, in terms of special events and field trips, um, parents and, and staff should essentially be thinking that any kind of special events that we host like a curriculum night will be um, online again, uh, certainly in the beginning of this year, the first uh, portion of our, our fall, we are, we're making plans for everything to be virtual. There could be some, some smaller gatherings that we may hold in person um, as we're starting the year. Some of you have been invited to orientations or um, you know, opportunities to meet perhaps in the auditorium. These will be, again, limited. Um, and we're also then thinking about in terms of fundraising, for example, the fall fair. We do not have a, a plan right now for that to be fully in person the way that it has been in the past. Um, so working on that, more to come. And then in terms of field trips, we're deciding field trips on a case-by-case -case basis. For vaccinated students, these cases are being handled differently and we are hoping to have um, by the end of the year, some overnights again being implemented and we're working on various contingencies and plans for that. Uh, for unvaccinated children, we are really focused on more kind of local and, and outdoor locations uh, or indoor locations that we know have strong safety measures. And if it requires a bus or transportation to get there, we are not looking to use the subways yet uh, or buses, the uh, city buses. And so if we are to um, rent a bus, we need to make sure that those bus windows can open and that we have agreement with the bus company how we're gonna treat um, distancing and um, you know supervision of children uh, around health and safety on, uh, during transportation. So that is the end of this presentation. Um, you have an opportunity to send us your questions or comments that we will look at before the town hall meeting and um, try to organize ourselves so that we can use that time well. Look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.